Hey guys, welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. It's Friday, time for another Ask Me Anything. Uh, house admin, before I get started, I don't think there's anything, nothing that I can think of. Had a few release dates come through, but I can't tell you what they are yet. Um, so, as usual, uh, if you've got a question you want to ask me about anything from production tips, techniques, to music industry stuff, to general opinions, whatever you want, ask me anything, uh, then comment below this video here and I'll get to it next week. Um, so straight into last week's and let's see what we've got. There's only a few here as far as I'm aware. Uh, Rod Marconi Ultimate High Five, Feel the Beat Ultimate High Five, Deadly Custard Ultimate Domo High Five, uh, Ben Bainbridge, I don't really appreciate the candid way you approach all the questions as a musician and producer. Which songs would you really love to emulate but can't for either technical or financial reasons or simply don't know how to achieve that kind of sound? Uh, don't know I guess um, it's not so much maybe well it could be a technical thing probably not a financial thing but I guess there are uh, artists like noisier who do pretty much the total opposite of my sort of music within electronic stuff um, uh, I'm a huge admirer of their work um, and I've seen a couple of sessions on how they approach their production um, and again it's worlds apart from mine um, I guess it's just not a technique I do and probably not a technique that I have the patience to do or maybe I'm not creative enough to to think in that way um, I guess other than that I mean really if there's a sort of I, I, I guess because I'm a sound designer as well there aren't really many sounds that I don't feel I could make there are probably a lot of sounds and styles that I think would be difficult to make and that would maybe not be cost effective in time or energy or whatever for me to make um, because, you know, I, I, there's obviously sounds out there that would take me a long time to work out how to make. Um, but yeah, but actually I, I kind of, I, I try not to, uh, and I think probably long time followers will probably know this already, but I, I sort of try not to um, to copy other people's styles. And actually I like, you know, in fact I said a couple of videos ago, um, when it comes to listening to music at home, I listen to a lot of sort of dub or reggae or jazz or classical or styles of music that I'm that I'm not involved in, and and part of the reason for that is because I can sit back and appreciate it for what it is. You know, uh, if you take a band like uh, Fat Freddy's Drop, amazing band, um, uh, you know their tracks Hope on uh, one of their albums, and then. The Blackbird album has Mother Mother. I mean, th those two tracks are sort of some of my all-time current favourite tracks. Um, and I guess that's something I couldn't do for technical and financial reasons because it's a, a full band and it's proper genuine music and, um, you know, it takes a certain amount of proficiency to, to, to create that sort of music. But at the same time, I kind of wouldn't want to because... I don't want to study their music, if that makes sense. I, I, I'd rather just put it on and just listen to it and enjoy it. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers it. Uh, Dead Mouse Cinco, uh, you must be the Mexican Dead Mouse. Uh, cheers mate, so how do you usually make your melodies? Where do you find inspiration the most? And how long are you actually producing now? So, how do you usually make your melodies? I usually... I say usually, it's 50-50. Sometimes I'll sit there with a synth and I will literally just 
play a series of notes on the keyboard um, obviously I'm in the temporary studio at the moment so I don't have my MIDI keyboard here but I have got a little one there you can't see it I'm blocking it down there over there I think you can see it um, and I'll quite often just sort of sit there and just play some notes in a scale in a random order and kind of see where it goes it's really kind of experimental or maybe just on piano roll on bitwig or whatever um other times i will just develop a chord phrase and then i sort of hear the melody in my head and sort of just ex again experiment with that and sort of bodge it until it works um, and then other times I suppose I'll sort of start with a drum groove and the bass line and basically have a, a almost a full track and I always, as you probably all know, I always like a, a melody on top of my track whether it's a, a one note bass line or a whole chord phrase um, so I think it, it, it sort of uh, it's really, I guess, more an experimentation of, of melodies and I'll sort of play with what works and what doesn't work, um, you know, and I guess it's just a lot of practice as well starts, you know, the more you learn things like the basic scales and basic music theory, you don't need to learn it massively in depth or anything, but the more you do learn, the more you can learn how to break those rules and things like that. Um, where do I find inspiration the most? Do you know what? I, 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 I used to find inspiration from other people's music, but then I found myself trying to almost imitate that music, and, and that's not really a, a good way of doing things. Uh, nowadays, I kind of force myself into getting inspired, and sometimes that's just by sitting there with a blank canvas, coming up with a chord phrase, and just playing on top of it and you know it might take you know an hour it might take three hours I might after three hours sit there and go this is rubbish close it down start again do another one try a different chord phrase try a, a different instrument um, and I guess that's probably one thing that inspires me the most is different sounds so sometimes I'll be sat there sound designing maybe a preset for a synth or just playing with a synth for for the love of it and I'll come up with a sound and I'll start thinking, oh, do you know what, that could sound really good with some maybe some reverb and delay. And then once I've hooked up the reverb and delay, then maybe I'll start just bouncing on notes, really. Um, so, yeah, and then how long have I been producing now? I started, I mean, I sort of learnt to play instruments and stuff from very early age, I had a musical family. But I started on the first Atari when I was 12, 13, something like that. And I'm now 36, so you do the math. Uh, a long time. Casey Music. Hey Dom, guess who's back? Uh, one last question, referring to your last live set answer. Do you think that it is eligible nowadays that some DJs just play out pre-recorded sets? I just saw Timmy Trumpet. Is that real? Timmy Trumpet. Last weekend at Frequency Festival. And I couldn't enjoy one bit of it because you saw so clearly that he didn't even turn a knob on his mixer. Do you think that this method... I mean, his name is Timmy Trumpet. <laughs> That's your first red flag. Uh, do you think that this method in the especially big festival industry is a competitor or even a danger for the art of live mixing? I mean, I can clearly, uh, I can see clearly referring to that very special Bodzin set on Circle, where live sets can or even should go, in my opinion, with the possibilities these days. That's a really important question, and also not an important question, because I think the answer is, it doesn't matter. Um, for me, I think, n no, people like that aren't a danger to the industry because it's always been there. You know, look at Britney Spears, look at Madonna, you know, look at a lot of those huge artists who sell out arenas and stadiums. Um, 
most of them mime on stage. They're not doing you know Britney Spears being a great example because uh, not only does she not sing live but she doesn't even write the songs or have any kind of musical input to the music in the first place so uh, you know she's literally just there to be a pretty face or whatever and, and, and I think while I'm not condoning that, that that's not the way it should be but at the same time it's kind of the way it always has been and you know us humans are, are fickle idiots and uh, you know we love gawping at a pretty face uh, whether it be male female whatever so I think you know what you're asking is is you know do you think Britney Spears is a danger to Bruno Mars's career well no because they're in different leagues and to me it's equivalent to asking you know is is a circus clown a danger to a Shakespeare actor's career well no because they're two different things um, I do think there's a bit of an overlap to be fair and like you say you know I, you know this was a big festival I'm guessing um, and they you know they do book a lot of what I would call novelty acts because for a promoter their job is to get bums on seats or feet on the floor selling tickets and you know if you put in a novelty act that everyone's heard of then you know you're gonna sell tickets um, you could be the most talented musician on earth but that doesn't guarantee that you're gonna sell tickets um, so I think a promoter's job is probably very difficult because they want to be seen as a promoter that books talent but at the same time they need to ensure that they're selling tickets so you know you have to give and take I think um, so yeah, so no, I, I don't think, you know, I, I do think there's a lot of things wrong with turning up and pressing play and not doing anything. For me, personally, I think it's a moral issue from the artist's perspective. I mean, I personally couldn't go to a gig. If, if somebody said to me, I'll pay you a huge amount of money, um, you don't need to do anything, we'll do the work for you, you just need to turn up and press play. Um, Personally, I, I can't imagine ever accepting that. Um, and if I do ever accept something like that and you see me faking something on stage and I can't justify it, then shoot me in the head because, you know, that's not the reason we get into this industry. Um, whereas I think some people get into this industry for Instagram likes and Facebook fans and, you know, um, those are the people that are willing to do anything for money. Um, and I don't know any of them personally, so I can't speak on their behalf, but um, I think because I surround myself in what I think are very talented people and artists, and I support anyone who I think has talent as an artist, so I just don't get involved in, in that side, and it doesn't bother me. Um, you know, I think it's a shame that there are some talented people out there who are not getting booked for gigs and, and they, you know, getting pushed out of the way for novelty acts. But, um, you know, I guess it comes down to a lot of us as consumers that we need to stop buying tickets if there's somebody called Timmy Trumpet on... on I, I don't know if this guy is famous, I've never heard of him, but with a name like Timmy Trumpet, um, I personally like I say that's your first red flag is clearly it's a novelty name for a novelty act and that's not for me uh, oh and as always ultimate high five uh, Bavaro or Bavar Zero uh, hey Dom big fan of all your productions here just wondering if you could ever make a video looking into the project you for your track so sue me uh, it's one of my absolute favorites would love some insight on how you made such a groovy clean sounding track cheers um, Probably not because I did do a video on structures which was in the same EP, but thank you for the support. Uh, so sue me. Um, what did I do on the drum groove that? Yeah, so that a lot of that came down to. You'll notice in that track, there are quite a few almost off kilter percussion hits, and if you listen to that track carefully, what I did was I created 
a, a hi-hat loop that had actually, I think there was kicks, hi-hats, everything, and I bounced that down as a loop and then dragged it back into the project and then I filtered the crap out of it. Um, I think I high pass and low pass and added a bunch of resonance and, and then stuck on, I think it was LFO tool or a sidechain compression basically. So that, that melted sort of sound is in between and, and breathing in between the kick drums. That was the sort of most important thing to get that thick body. The other thing I had to make sure to do was to get some really short, sharp kicks that had a high transient on them so they cut through that uh, groove and then the third element on those drums is to get off kilter so I think it was like 16th notes but you miss the first one hit the second one and then miss the third one hit the fourth one so they're, they're almost out of sync um, but they were really again almost muted short sharp toms of varying timbres um so i had one that was like a really deep sub um i think it was in between beat two and three or maybe three and four there's a deep sub thud in there and that that kind of because it's off beat and and staggered that sort of brings in a, a groove to um the loop and then there were some sort of higher toms floating around in there um, and yeah and I guess that was that was the way of getting that groove because the the melody and everything I'd put together for that track was kind of a groovy melody and everything you'll notice in that track in terms of melody the um, what I call the NL3 synth snabs everything's in eighth notes basically so it's very sort of militant in um, in its style so what I did was made sure the drums sort of wrapped around that which is why they're on the off 16th notes because on the 8th notes so the first 16th and the third 16th and so on um, you know they're, they're short sharp stabs whether it be a kick or the synth melody so um, I had to basically wrap around that with a percussion um, and I think that's probably a, a good tip to, to give to anyone is, is sometimes when you're developing percussion, and this is qu why I quite often recommend to people, if you're going to use a loop, mash it up. And if you're going to create it from scratch, make sure there's plenty of different sounds in there of different dynamics, of different volumes and, uh, and everything, because you can move them around in the grid and, and listen to them compared to the melody. Because... In an ideal world, you want your drum groove to wrap around the melody, so there's a constant change of dynamics in your track. Um, yeah, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. Um, yeah, I think. And that is the last question, so it's a really quick video this week. Next week I'm going to be opening it up, I think, to Twitter and Facebook a couple of days before. Um, so if you do want to answer or ask questions there, then hopefully in next week's video, um, I'll have already done that. So you'll see in next week's video, I'll be answering hopefully more questions. Um, yeah, and that is it. I've got loads of work to do. It's Friday, so I need to get cracking. And I hope you guys have a good weekend. Um, if you have made it this far into the video, well done for you. I am gonna say comment the keyword zoom uh, to show that you've made it this far. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next week. Cheers.